G'day. Uh, good to be getting stuck into the Gospel of Matthew once more. Uh, let's pray and uh, seek God's help as we do that. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you for the way that as we come to your word, we encounter your son, Jesus. And as we do that, I pray that your spirit would work in us uh, to help us go deeper in our understanding and love of the Lord Jesus that we may live lives that bring glory to the name of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, well, continuing on with chapter 12 today. Uh, so let's read that, starting at verse 22. So Matthew 12, 22 to 37. Then he brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if by the Spirit of God that I... If, sorry. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a, good, make a tree good, and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Well, let's get into it. Uh, so as the passage goes on, uh, once again, Jesus uh, performs a, a miracle. He heals a man, uh, a man possessed by a demon, we're told, and this possession has caused him uh, to be blind and mute. Um, but Jesus heals the man. Um, and I think we, we need to recognize what the Bible actually teaches us here, because our modern Western sensibilities uh, seem to uh, look down on us uh, when we think of such things like this, that there are, in fact, spiritual forces at work in this world. The Bible is unashamedly supernatural. And Jesus here encounters that. Right? There are spiritual forces at work in this world and that we ignore those spiritual forces to our own peril. That reminds me of uh, the final scene uh, in, a, in a famous movie called The Usual Suspects, a movie that almost pioneered the way for that, that dramatic twist that basically unravels what you thought was the story and puts that final piece of the jigsaw, jigsaw um, in so that you see everything clearly right at the end of the movie. Uh, but there's this moment when uh, the, the person who you find out is actually the villain the whole time um, uh, he narrates uh, this line. He says, The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And so we ignore the reality of the spiritual forces that are at work in our world to our own peril. But Jesus came to conquer these forces. And as we see here, he brings healing. Now, as we've been saying, one of the key things that we're meant to Learn from Jesus' miracles is the answer to the question, 
that the disciples asked in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm. They say, oh, who is this guy? Who is this man? All right. Uh, his miracles, Jesus' miracles are like his resume uh, that, say, that says with crystal clear clarity, Jesus is not only the Messiah, but he is God himself come to save us. Uh, and that's why in this passage, once again, the people say, could this be the son of David? The son of David being a, a, a key um, way that they, they referred to the coming Messiah in Jesus' day, because we are told that it would be a, a son of David who would sit upon the throne. Uh, you can go and read the promises that God made to King David in 2 Samuel 7 about that. Uh, and so that's what the people ask. But the Pharisees, uh, they, they're entrenched in their belief that there is no possible way that Jesus could be who he uh, claims to be or who his miracles point uh, to, to him to be. They're entrenched that there's no way Jesus could be the Messiah, let alone the Son of God. And that that leaves them in their minds with only one logical explanation that, that, that can account for all the amazing things that Jesus has done. And that's that, well, he's working for Satan. Right? Uh, Beelzebul being just another name for Satan, by the way, for the devil. Uh, Jesus responds in brilliant fashion by totally destroying their own logic. Uh, and the, the summary of it is, what possible use would it be for Satan to drive out Satan? I mean, Jesus' point is that that kind of thinking is just absurd. And, you know, from that, um, comes that a rather famous proverbial phrase that's used in all sorts of contexts now in our day. A kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. A house divided cannot stand. Um, and I mean, you know, think of the political division that exists in the United States of America. And then look what's happening on the news at the moment. It's troubling. But the logic is there. Right? A kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Uh, then Jesus confronts them with the reality of the situation. In verse 28, Jesus says, But you know what? If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, which is exactly what he is doing, then this is the reality for you guys. The kingdom of God has come upon you. And, it, and our English loses something of the emphasis that Jesus is, uh, of Jesus' words. Jesus is really driving it home to them at this point. Right? He's saying that the kingdom of God is right in front of you. Right? Because the king is standing before you. Right? And this is what Jesus' miracles point to. This is the reality um, of the kingdom of God come uh, with Jesus. Uh, in verse 29, Jesus basically says, I'm not for Satan. In fact, I've come here to defeat Satan. I've come to tie up the strong man so that I can win people for the kingdom. And then Jesus gives the Pharisees an ultimatum. He, he, he says, he who is not with me is against me. And you don't want to be against me, right? Because there are sins that will be forgiven. But those who stand against me, well, that's a sin that won't be forgiven. And that's, this, that's the essence of what Jesus says in verse 32. Anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Right? In the context, Jesus is referring to exactly what the Pharisees did do. Right? They called the work of the Spirit through Jesus evil. They said it was by Satan's hand that he's doing these things. And if you continue down that road, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and effectively to us, there is no hope for you. Right? Christians sometimes get a little bit fixated on this verse. I've had conversations with people where they ask, oh, what, what's the unforgivable sin that Jesus is talking about? What does it mean when he says, you know, blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Oh, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Have I done the unforgivable sin? And I want to say that if you're asking yourself that question, genuinely asking, have I done that against God? then that is evidence that, no, you have not done it. Because when we look at it in its context, it's, it's about those who stand fervently opposed to the work that Jesus is doing. Right? If you stand against him, 
Right? Jesus continues to put the Pharisees in their place. Um, and he says, you know, good tree, good fruit. Bad tree, bad fruit. You're going to know a tree by its fruit. Right? And clearly he's having a go here because the Pharisees are not producing good fruit. Uh, and just in case that's not clear, uh, we, can, we can sense Jesus' frustration, his anger, his righteous anger at those who should have known better. Right? These are the, some of the people that are meant to be the spiritual leaders of the people of God. And they don't get it. And so he says, you brood of vipers. Right? It's not Jesus meek and mild here. You brood of vipers. Right? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, the Pharisees have just revealed where their hearts are at. Right? Be careful, he says. Judgment is coming. By your words, you will either be condemned or acquitted. And what does that mean? Well, this is what Jesus is really getting at when he talks about speaking against the Holy Spirit. You know, our words reveal what's going on inside our hearts. That's what Jesus has just said. And so when he says that our words will either condemn or acquit us, what's he saying? He's saying where your heart's at is what's going to determine your eternal destiny. Do you trust in Jesus or do you reject him? Um, Paul says it like this uh, in Romans 10 verse 9. And, you know, the gospel really is wonderfully simple. Uh, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice the connection that Paul makes. We confess with our mouth what's going on in our hearts. So if you confess Jesus with your mouth because Jesus is the love of your heart, you will be saved. But if you don't, well, you will be condemned. That's what Jesus just said. He said that to the Pharisees, and it's true for everyone today. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one, can come to the Father except through Him. Because He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God come to save us. Let's pray and give thanks to God for Jesus, that He came and bound up the strong man to save us, that He came to bring salvation, that those who confess with their lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts, God raised him from the death, are indeed saved. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the Messiah, the King, that you, have, that you promised long ago would come to save us. Thank you that he then died on the cross uh, to bear the punishment for our sin. And that when we confess him as Lord, when we trust in him, when we believe in our hearts that he did indeed rise from the dead, conquering Satan, sin and death. Lord, what a promise we have. We are saved. For the gospel is the gospel of grace, that we are not saved by what we do, but we are saved by what Jesus has done. And so we thank you for him. And we pray that you'd help us to continue to fix our eyes on him. And Lord, to live in the light of the gospel. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, continue to fix your eyes on Jesus. And uh, yeah, tune in tomorrow.